Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the very first GWIS cohort webinar. We're so excited to have you here. We have lots of people that have registered tonight, so I'm sure we'll have some folks come in the end um, as we get started. But pretty much all of you are on mute. So um, if you have a question, you will see in the top right hand corner a little hand and um, you can either click there, but really the best way to send us a question during this webinar is in that question box right there on the right hand side. If you'll type in your questions there, then we'll be able to answer them throughout uh, the webinar because unless you're on your phone, it's very difficult to unmute you. Um, we're, I'm going to turn it over real quick to Beth Smith, and she's going to explain a little bit about why we came up with the cohort uh, concept and how it's going to work throughout this year, and what you should be expected, um, what you should be expecting to come down with the next ones each and every month after now. So, Beth. Good evening, everybody. Um, like Sherry said, my name is Beth Smith. I'm one of the partners with GWIS Education, and we're very excited about the GWIS cohort. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about why or how we're doing this, but I do want to cover a little bit about the cohort. Our goal behind this was twofold. One was to help those of you who are customers with GWIS go through the monthly units that we're posting so that you know what's coming up. You can get prepared a little earlier. You'll see that as of this month, we've started posting both units on the 20th, and that is our goal. Um, that being said, if one of us gets the flu, it might be the 21st, <laughs> but we're going to shoot for the 20th uh, to give you a little more time to get ready. The other part of that is to help those of you who are interested in learning more about GWIS, to learn more about the curriculum and how we work. In addition to reviewing the units coming up for the next month, we will also cover a topic related to early childhood or family child care. And um, for this webinar, it's going to be language development that we will focus on. Um, it might be things like parental involvement. It could be adapting experiences for different developmental areas or different developmental levels. It might be questioning and why that's important. Every month there will be a focus in addition to reviewing the units. So that way those of you who are customers can integrate that new knowledge into the units as you do them with the children. And those of you who are not customers will gain some very important information regarding early childhood development. We are recording this well webinar, so we will be covering a lot of information. If you would like to go back and review it at the end, um, we will post it in another day or so on our website in the video section of our website, but also we have a YouTube channel, which is GWIS Education for FCC, and we will post it there as well. There's a handout in the box to your right, and that handout actually has a link to a Google form, which is a post assessment. If you would like to have a certificate of attendance for this webinar, you will need to complete that assessment. Please don't freak out. It is not that hard. It's only 10 questions. Um, and then we will be able to send that certificate of attendance to you. So, at, with that all said, what we're going to do tonight is a couple of things. One, we are going to go over the August units, which are about the fair and friends. That will be one of the first things that we do. And then we're going to go back into those units and talk a little bit about language development, what it is, how GWIS addresses language development, but also how you can address language development. As Sherry mentioned earlier, there is a question tab that you can use because I'm going to pause frequently during this webinar. Believe me, I am not going to talk the whole time. And I would like you to type in your ideas and share. And then Sherry will share those with the group. And we will all learn from each other because just like children, that's how adults learn as well. So right now we're on the GWIS website. Those of you who are customers are well aware of what this looks like. Um, this is where the curriculum lives. Unlike other options that might be out there, we do not ship a box of materials. Everything we do lives on gwiseducation.com. And when you become a customer of GWIS Education, you're, you have a username and a password that allows you to sign in. So what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to sign in. And I'm going to put in my username, and I hope I remember my password. 
And when I do that, you're going to see that the, the tabs at the top of the page have now changed and there's a new tab here that says GWE customers. I'm going to go to that tab and I'm going to click on this month's units. And we actually have a step-by-step -step guide for those of you who may not be customers or those of you who are brand new that walks you through exactly what I am doing right now. And I will show you where to find that. So if you wanted to print it out and have it right beside you as you do this the first time or the second time to help you through the process, you certainly can do that. Um, our first unit for August, as I said, is called Fair Time Fun. And before we talk about this unit, the reason this was chosen for August is that in a lot of parts of the country, getting into particularly August and September is a time when many areas have agricultural fairs. I live outside of Washington, D.C. in the suburbs. But believe it or not, just north of me in Montgomery County, Maryland, there is an agricultural fair that I used to take my kids to when they were little that had everything from cows and sheep and pigs and bunnies to pig races, believe it or not, and rides and everything in between. And so we know that a lot of you live in areas where there are agricultural or 4-H fairs. I grew up in an area in Pennsylvania where we had a 4-H fair as well. But we also know that there are those of you who might live in a place where that's not something that is as common. And so one of the things that we do in GWIDS education in our, our units is we provide links to particularly very short YouTube videos that can help you expose children to new ideas and new concepts. So let's say you live in an area where maybe your children have never experienced a fair or maybe have never been to a fair. You're going to find when we go into the teacher's guide, there are some links that you can use to expose them to this concept. But right now I want to ask a question. So um, you can all type in the question box. Let's say you live in an area where maybe your children have been to a fair or maybe they have not. What open-ended question could you ask the children as you prepare for this unit? Not once you get ready to start it, but like in the next two weeks as you're getting ready to prepare for it. What could you ask the children to gain some kind of um, basis for yourself of what they already know about fairs. So if you want to type your answer in the question box, and I'm going to pause for a second and Sherry can read your responses back. We'll give you plenty of time to kind of type that in. And don't worry about grammar, spelling, I'm the worst. So. Sherry won't tell me if you spell something. <laughs> no one will know. Okay. <laughs> um, first question, have they ever been to a fair? Has anyone been to a fair before? Um, what animals do you think you will see there? Um, we have several in our area, so most likely they have been to the fair. Excellent. I said, T tell me about what you might see at a fair. That's a really good open-ended. Um, do you like going to the fair? Um, have, do you know what a fair is? What do, you th what do you think you might see at a fair? And what do you think when you hear someone talking about going to the fair? Oh, that, that's a very good open question. Those what are, are your favorite animals at the fair? Okay, great job. All excellent questions. I love the open-endedness and it will really help you as you engage children in that conversation to figure out, okay, where do I start? You know, where do I begin this unit? What do they already know? Do I need to get more books? Do I need to watch more videos? Do I need to get some, um, the internet is a wonderful source for printing out images. Like you could just Google in Google Images, agricultural fair, and I guarantee you, you're gonna find a lot of things you could print out to post on your walls um, to help expose them to what a fair looks like. So those are all excellent questions and that's super important beginning any unit to kind of get an idea of where the children are. What do they already know? It doesn't matter if you're doing dinosaurs or community helpers. It, it's really going to be different depending on the unit and your children, what they already know about a topic. And those types of questions are super important. You did a great job. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to click on the English files, mainly because I do not speak Spanish. So if I go into the Spanish files, I can't read anything. So I'm going to click on the English files. 
and you'll notice that in this folder or on this page you're going to find an ex um, an overview of what the unit's going to be about and then all the different components that are part of this unit so one of the most important components as those of you who are customers know is our teaching guide and our teaching guide contains lesson plans for this unit there are 10 days of lesson plans and in each day there's an exploring together which is like a circle time but i'll explain why it's not a circle time there are small group experiences and there's an infant experience as well as school age experiences and the teaching guide is like your foundation all right with GWiz, we want to help you build the foundation of your house. Now, what the house looks like on the top is really up to you. So we're providing the foundation. We're providing the unit. We're, we're integrating all the 10 developmental areas so you don't have to worry about that. We're integrating all the different age groups so you don't have to worry about that. But when it comes down to making that house look the way you want it to look, you're going to customize this based on your children and their interests and their developmental levels. We give you some help in doing that with different activities so you can adapt them but when it comes right down to it you know your children you know what makes them tick you know what makes them not tick and what they don't like and so you have to adapt modify and add your own experiences to really enhance this unit to make it yours okay so what I'm going to do right now is I want to go into the teaching guide and all of our experience, all of our materials, the majority of which, for those of you who are not customers, are PDF files. So as long as you have Acrobat Reader loaded on your computer, which most do these days, have that automatically loaded, you should have no problem opening these files. That said, too, some of you may want to print this. Here's where you would do that. On, I'm on a PC, by the way. It may look a little different on a Mac, but when I move my cursor up to the top magically this bar appears and I can choose to print this or I can choose to download and save it which brings up a good point we are a digital curriculum everything we do lives on our website for 45 days this unit fair time fun was posted and now it will live here for 45 days at the end of 45 days we will take it away why? Why do you ask that we take it away? Because if we didn't take it away and we had all these files from the many years we've done this up here, our system would, our, our website would be so slow it would literally crash. So what we encourage you to do, and now that we're posting both units on the 20th, is to simply go out on the 20th or around the 20th and download and save all these files to your computer in a folder. So you might want to create a folder that says fair time fun or whatever the unit is. Go up here to this download button and just download all all the files into fair time fun that way you have them they're on your computer we also encourage you to back them up to a flash drive to a hard drive to the cloud i use google drive personally because it's free and i can save all my files there and then i know when i lose my flash drive i know where my files are so you want to save them someplace as a backup um, but you can also print them and the beauty of GWiz is you can choose to print or not to print many, many, many of the components. This is our teaching guide. Some of our providers who use this print it out. Some of them just view it on their computer or tablet. That is totally up to you. You can print it in color. You can print it in black and white. You can print it in two-sided, one-sided, not printed at all. That's up to you. Um, but again, that's mainly for those of you who are not customers, those of you who are already know this, but since we have a mix of people on this webinar, I want to make sure I cover that. Then this page just starts with an introduction. Um, I'm going to show you in the materials list where we've now started putting a lot of those things that might need a little bit of extra time to locate. I encourage you as well to utilize parents and guardians as helpers in this process. And that might seem like, oh my gosh, I can't get parents and guardians to do anything. But you know what? Sometimes when you ask the child and you say, hey, you know, do you happen to have a stuffed cow at home or a plastic cow that you could bring in for this unit we're going to do on the fair? Man, especially if that child is an older child, that is a great responsibility. And like, wow, my teacher wants me to look for a plastic cow. And then they're like, mom, dad, I need a plastic cow. Can you help me find one? And it's really a great way to involve the whole family in whatever unit's coming up. 
it won't always work, but it's worth a shot. Um, this gives you an overview of the unit. And again, here's a link to a YouTube video. It's very short about the fair. So if you live in an area where your children do not necessarily have had a lot of experience with an agricultural fair, that's something you might wanna show at the beginning of this unit, just to give them some exposure. Um, this is our table of contents that just explains what's in this teaching guide. And then this is a reminder of all the different developmental areas that we cover. For those of you who are not customers, and even those of the, you who are, in the GWIS curriculum, we use pictures to help you connect the learning experiences presented in the lesson plans to the developmental areas. And there are 10 of them, and each one has a picture associated with it, which you can see right here. So when you see, for instance, this, as I call it, speech bubble, which is what we're going to talk about tonight, you know that the activity that you're addressing is going to, or you're going to do with the children is going to address language development. Same thing if you see this hand, you know it's going to address physical development and health. This is our way of helping you basically connect the dots. Um, if you see this, it's a gross motor activity. If you see this, it means it can be done outside. Sometimes if it's water play, it probably should be done outside. And the CE is for character education. We integrate kindness, responsibility, honest, honesty, and respect into the lesson plan. So those are the four character traits you'll find interwoven into the activities that we do. And that's our character education. The next page of the lesson plans is a grid that explains basically all the activities that are in this teaching guide in addition to if you keep scrolling the school age experiences. Some providers who are customers have told us that they will actually print this one page out even if they don't print out the rest of the guide they'll print this one page and they'll post it because they're required by their state or their agency to have parents aware of what's going on and the activities they have planned. That's not to say this is an end all by any means but it is your again your foundation so they will print this out and post it on a bulletin board or they will email it to parents just this one page so they know what is going to be going on for the next unit and then we actually go into the lesson plans um, this unit again is about the fair so we start with what is a fair our story props are actually a counting story so we're interweaving counting and math with a story so language literacy math all interwoven plus you can throw in social studies because you're actually talking about a fair which is in many places a community event um, for those of you who are not familiar with GWIS this cumulative list at the top is all the areas of development that this one day addresses okay just one day if you do all the experiences we have planned on the next two pages you will address all these areas which are social and emotional language development physical development and health approaches to learning music science math social studies creative arts and literacy okay so all those areas in just a few activities we have a health and safety tip every day, which I encourage you to read. We have a teaching tip every day and a transition idea. In some states, as I'm reading through standards, transition ideas are something that you're required to do. And so this is a way for you to move the children physically and mentally from one activity to the other during the course of the day. This blue box over here is for modeling language. These are words that we want you to incorporate as you have conversations with children. For those of you who are not familiar with GWIS, one of the big things about our curriculum is interactions with children and engaging with children. Um, we will talk a lot about this through our open-ended questions, through our modeling language. And the reason for that is it's very powerful. Right? When you engage children in conversations, you learn a lot and they learn a lot too. And you're like, well, most of my kids don't talk or they're not very verbal. That's okay. Because even if there's one child who is verbal and you're having a conversation with them, guess what? Those nonverbal children are like little sponges. They're absorbing everything that's going on around them. And so even though they might not speak those words and that vocabulary for a long time, they will know what they mean. Um, these are some other tips on how to model language during the course of this day. And then we get into the exploring together. And we used to call this, as I mentioned earlier, circle time. 
And we decided that that was just not a really good term because during the course of this experience, the children and you as a provider are exploring and learning together. And so during this exploring together, you're gonna to be doing the fair counting story, which I'm gonna show you what that actual material looks like when we get out of the lesson plans, but it's something that you wanna prepare ahead of time. And I know that you are all way, way, way busy. And like, that's putting it mildly. But some of you, during the summer especially, have, guess what, school-age children. And I bet they can cut on a line. And I bet they can paste. So put them to work. Give them your flannel board story for a fair counting story. Let them glue it on a piece of harder paper. Let them cover it with contact paper and let them cut it out. Um, put them to work. Even your, your more advanced four-year-olds or if you have any fives who are getting ready to go to kindergarten, that one particularly is straight line cutting. There is no reason why they couldn't help you. And let me tell you, they will feel very proud if they can help you prepare that. So um, I know you're super busy. Use those hands that you have and put them to work, give them a task to do. At that age, most children are really, really happy to do anything to help you out. They feel very proud when they get to do that. And it's also a great way to build character education because guess what? They're showing kindness and their responsibility. You're giving them a task to do that they have to follow through with that's important to you and important to the group. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind when you have things to prepare ahead of time. If you have school-age children or you have more advanced children, let them give you a hand. Um, and then this just walks you through the experience as those of you who are customers know. And here are the open-ended questions. And again, this has a lot to do with modeling language and building language the questions that you might want to ask, like how much do you think it would cost to go to a fair? Or why do you think people like to go to fairs? There's no right or wrong answer to that question, but it's a great question to get the children thinking and to get an, a conversation going. Um, for those of you and many of you out there who are evaluated using either Fickers or class, this is the kind of interactions that they want to see. They want to see those back and forth conversations with you that are engaging children in questions that really get them to think beyond yes and no, black and white. Um, so that being said, I'm going to stop for just a second and give you guys a task to do. You did such a great job on the front end. Let me see if you can come up with an open-ended question that you could ask during the course of this activity that exposes the children to what a fair is. And you can type it in the question box. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. <laughs> um, we don't have any yet. We do have one question, not while some of you are thinking about what Beth asked you to do. Uh, there's one question, do you have a crosswalk uh, for the curriculum in class? And I believe this person may be from Ohio. Um, well, and Beth, you may address just what we just posted this week. I will. I will definitely address that. Um, class is a privately held um, assessment of the environment, as is Vickers. So we can't actually crosswalk with class. But if you're in Ohio, we just posted alignments or sample alignments with one of our August units to. Um, three of the forms that providers are required to complete for one, a star level one to a, um, choose a curriculum, and then for the infants and toddlers in preschool as they move up the star chain. Um, I've looked at class. I know exactly what it looks like. I actually have the documentation and have the books in my possession. So I can say with certainty that I believe that if providers use this curriculum as directed and ask these types of open-ended questions, engage children in conversations, that they should score quite well on it. But it's not something that I feel like we can necessarily crosswalk with, being that it's not something like the Head Start Performance Standards, if that makes any sense, um, which we actually are crosswalk with their early birth to five standards, um, because it is not And your something... document, and yes. you may share those documents, the JFS-01507-05-01590 and 0591. They're right. all on They're our posted website. on our, our um, homepage. When you scroll down to the states, the United States map under Ohio, you'll see them all listed. And they're mainly there to give providers guidance 
as they have to complete those forms. So it's it's our way of saying, okay, we took one of our units, we're showing you how we align with one of the units, which would be representative of any unit actually that we do. Okay, and Sherry, you have any, any questions? I, okay, yes. Um, why do you think farmers get together for a fair each year? Oh, so someone wants you to repeat the question real quick, Beth. <laughs> and My question was, what would you ask the children during this activity where you're exposing them to the concept of what a fair is? Having read those questions to spur thinking, what other questions could you ask that are similar to that? Okay, what kind of animals do you think you will see at the fair? Um, I personally see. hope I see a cow. <laughs> A fair is a place for those families who have animals are able to share with the public and how they can take care of the animals. That's a really good point because that's a big part of 4-H if you go to a 4-H fair is caring for the animals. Last week some of you went to the carnival and rode rides. What do you think the fair is like? Mm. What kind of food might you find at the fair? <laughs> Things that are not good for you but taste really good. <laughs> Uh, what do you think you'll find at the fair? Okay. Um, and then this, let, let's see, I need to, um, okay. We'll have, there's next question is I'll address offline. Okay. <laughs> as far as your question, right. I think we've covered that. Okay, cool. All right. Those were excellent questions. And that's oh, the key. Sorry. I do have one or two more that look pretty good. Can you tell me about a place where these animals, food, music, and fun rides? Where do you think the farmers bring their animals to share? Why do you think the farmers bring their animals to share with us? Mm -hmm. And what do you think the farmers being, why do you think the farmers bring their animals to share with us? Those are all great And questions. what do you think actually happens on the farm to get ready for the fair? Those are all Ooh. really good. They're very good questions. You guys are on the ball tonight. You must have had something really good for dinner tonight, so your brain is working very well. <laughs> All right, so now after the first day, uh, first page, we then, and here's another YouTube video, again, a link to a very short video you can share with the children about an agricultural fair um, if they don't have background knowledge in this area. And then these two experiences in pink are your small group experiences. Many of these you are going to find are child directed. All right, so what does that mean exactly, child directed? When we look at child directed at GWIZ, we mean that you're going to set up the experience and the children are going to kind of take it in any direction they would like to. Does that mean that you're not involved at all? Absolutely not. You are still going to be there observing. You're going to still be there engaging. You're going to ask open-ended questions. Um, it doesn't mean that you're going to set it up and leave because a lot of what goes on when a child is leading a direction, leading an experience is super important in terms of their thought processes. And by asking open-ended questions, you can gain some insight into, okay, where are they going with this? Which might also lead, by the way, to adapting and expanding upon their interests and their ideas as you move through this unit. So that's another way you can individualize. That's another way you can do an emergent curriculum because once you set up the experience, then you watch and you ask questions and that can lead to something else. Um, books are a very important part of this. And we know that a lot of you have limited budgets to buy books, but the library is an excellent source. Um, there are also a lot of books these days at thrift stores and Goodwill and yard sales that are in excellent condition and cost next to nothing to purchase. And again, don't be afraid to ask your children and your parents if they might have some books that they would be willing to loan if they tie in with the unit that you're talking about. Um, so one of these experiences is learning about the fairs. We actually suggest in, in this case, since it is August, to take them outside. Um, it is very interesting to watch what happens when you take an indoor activity, like maybe reading books, and take it outside. Um, same thing with puzzles or um, building blocks like Legos. Take them outside and just watch what happens. It's very, very interesting when you change the environment, what, how children take that 
learning in a totally different direction. And then the second experience is tickets for the fair, because as we know, most fairs require you to buy a ticket to get in. And so during this experience, the children use index cards, crowns, and stickers to make their own tickets for the fair. Now, toddlers, twos, even your young threes, they're not quite ready to make tickets for the fair, but guess what? They're going to have fun scribbling on those index cards, and they're going to have fun putting those stickers on there, and they're going to learn as they watch your older children make their own tickets. All right, and that also opens the door for their older children to talk about letters, letter sounds, as you, they dictate maybe some words they want you to put on their tickets, or maybe they want the price on there, or the name of the fair. Um, it opens the door for a lot of different learning and a lot of different directions. And then the last experience for today is your infant experience in purple. So for those of you who are not familiar with GWIZ, we always have an infant experience every day. And this one happens to be a, a song to sing. Does that mean that toddlers, or twos, or your other children aren't going to want to join in? Absolutely not. They probably are. But it just means it's an experience that's designed for infants that you could do one-on-one -on -one with them. And actually in our next unit for August, back to school, which has a very heavy friends um, focus, we involve some of the older children in the experiences as well. So I'm not gonna spend, obviously, or we will be here all night. <laughs> I'm gonna spend a, a lot of time going through every single day of the lesson plans. But what I do wanna point out, which is important, is the focus. Up here every day, you're gonna see what the focus of the day is. And so when you first download and print out or view this lesson plan book with your activities for the upcoming unit, take a look at the focuses and think about, okay, what do I have on hand that I can maybe gather to use with this? So small animals at the fair. We think about bunny rabbits, right? Um, we think about piglets. <laughs> I love piglets. Um, we think about the little animals that people will raise and bring to the fair. So you might want to incorporate those into your dramatic play area or into your blocks area. All right. So just think about that. Um, <clears throat> in this one, we're talking about chickens, ducks, and bunnies. Okay, and again, you're going to have your exploring together and you're going to have your small group experiences. Remember, some of them are more child directed. Some of them do have a teacher component. Bunny tail tag actually starts with a teacher component, but then leads into more of a child directed. Waddling in the water, totally child directed. But again, you're going to be involved because you're going to observe, you're going to ask questions, you're engaging. Um, and there's your baby activity, your infant activity. Um, the next day, large animals at the fair. We think about cows, we think about pigs, we think about horses, all right? And you're going to see all these things here again. Um, you, same thing, you have your learning, uh, you're exploring together. There happens to be a YouTube there. It's really cool about horses doing tricks, um, how they train them to jump over things. Um, and two small group experiences and then your infant experience. Next day, crafts to see at the fair. Um, if you've ever been to a 4-H or an agricultural fair, this is a big part of the fair. There are people who work on craft projects, woodworking, sewing, knitting, um, baking, canning, all kinds of different things that they do all year long to prepare for the fair. Um, so this is built into this day here. And then on the next day, we move into canned and baked goods at the fair, okay? Again, that's a big part of an agriculture or a 4-H fair. When I was a kid, I grew up in central PA. We had 4-H, one of the things I did was cooking. And um, some of those recipes, believe it or not, I have a peanut cookie recipe that I still make to this day. And it's been way too many years since I was in 4-H. <laughs> um, but here's an experience I want to point out, um, canned versus fresh. Occasionally, we will build in an experience as a small group experience that can also count as your snack experience. And in this case, it's comparing a canned fruit to a fresh variety. And this is a perfect time of year to do this, right? Because peaches are in season, pears are almost in season. So there are lots of fruits out there that you could buy the canned variety and then have a fresh variety. And that's a big deal, right? Comparing how the two are the same, how the two are different. It opens a door for a ton of language um, and a ton of vocabulary. So you will see these things in red. And again, when we get to the materials list, we'll point out how they're in red. And that's so you know, you might want to 
put them on the shopping list so you have like a canned peach and a fresh peach ready for that tasting experience. The next one is woodworking and art at the fair. During this day, we actually encourage you, if at all possible, to do woodworking with the children. You're like, oh my gosh, there's only me, hammers, nails, saws. No, 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 no. You might be surprised if you ask, especially if it's still summertime, if there's somebody like a parent who could come in to help with this. Um, if you're not comfortable with nails and hammers, you can still go to Home Depot. They often have scraps of lumber. You just wanna make sure not to get the pressure treated lumber because it is treated with a lot of chemicals. Just get the regular lumber and then get some sandpaper. Even your little people can use sandpaper. They might not use it the way it's intended and they might not use it accurately, but if you're doing it outside, it doesn't really matter. It's still just the expiration of doing it. It's the smell of the wood. It's the feel of the sandpaper. It's a very sensory experience. So it doesn't need to be with hammers and nails if you're not comfortable or you don't have the ability to do that because you don't have supervision. You could still just do it with pieces of lumber and sandpaper. So again, if you go to Home Depot your, or your lumber yard, oftentimes they'll have extra chunks of wood that they're more than happy to give to you, especially if you explain to them why you need it. Um, and it's a really cool sensory experience for children to do. Then we move on to the next experience. The next day is music at the fair. That's often a really big part of the fair is music. There'll be concerts, there'll be dances. There might even be competitions of dancing. It just depends on where you are, what's going on. But music is also something that children love to engage with. So this is great. It opens the door in so many different ways. And then we move on to day eight, which is rides at the fair again children always remember the rides um and as my mom used to say don't ride dangerous rides although it seems like at the fair there are often dangerous rides um but anyway this opens the door again for talking about a part of the fair that many children if they've ever been to one might have experienced whether that be the ferris wheel whether it be a kitty ride um, my children will never forget the honey bear pot ride which was like these giant strawberries they sat in and it was like 100 degrees and they thought they were going to melt so i'm sure if you ask them now at age 20 and 17 they would still remember sitting in the honey pot ride at the fair um, and a, a part of the fair when you talk about rides is that's it opens the door for a lot of STEM is how they work. You know, there are a lot of gears, there might be belts, and this opens a door for this experience right here where you're gonna adapt it for different levels depending on where they are, talking about how things work, how they move, wheels and, and pulleys and, and inclines and declines and all those good things. Day nine is games at the fair. And our games are all going to be fair, and there's not going to be any um, nefarious things going on. <laughs> so we are going to all play games that where we all get to win a prize. Um, and part of it's going to be where they make up their own games and see how they take that. And then the last day is going to be our fair. And they're going to have their own fair. And there's going to be all kinds of experiences here in this part that you can pick and choose from. And I would encourage you at the same time to also bring back any of the experiences the children really liked. And they're going to make a yummy treat, which is um, English muffin pizzas. Again, we do incorporate cooking from time to time. And the reason we do that is because cooking is a wonderful sensory experience. It also, if you're cooking something like a muffin where you have to measure ingredients, introduces the children to measurement in a very meaningful way. Um, in this case, they're not really necessarily measuring. But it also opens the door talking about how things change. Like when you put the pizza together before you put it in the oven, how does it change? And so they can make predictions about what's going to happen, those who are more verbal, and they can talk about how it did change when they observe it at the end once it's baked. Um, so we do incorporate that, and that might be part of your prep for lunch that day. Maybe you want to serve English muffin pizzas for lunch, and the children can help prep them. And then we move into our school age experiences, which um, as those of you who are customers know, these are those experiences for children who are either with you during the summer or come after school during the school year. They are for children who are more advanced. There's a lot more writing. 
there's a lot more um, science and a lot more hands-on experience going on in terms of a higher level. So these are things that you would want to do with your school-age children. So does it mean you couldn't do them with younger ones? Absolutely not. If you read the experience, like, oh gosh, all my children would really like that. Absolutely. If you feel like they're ready for it and they can do it, then by all means. That is totally up to you. Um, so we go through our school-age experiences and then Here's the preparation for the counting story, okay? I told you originally there's a counting story that ties in the fair with math and it also is literacy. Here's the text that you'll read and then I'll show you in a minute where the props are that I again express that maybe if you have a school ager they can help you prepare. But here's the text for that story and this one happens to be a counting story. It's also a rhyming story. So as the children learn the story, as you tell it over and over again, you can say things like six happy cows eating lots of grass. Can you hear them mooing when you walk? And then you stop. And eventually they'll be able to fill that word in past. Okay, and that's a great way for them to be exposed to rhyming words in a very meaningful way. And they begin to hear that those words sound similar. Um, these are extension ideas on how you can use those props in other ways. Uh, that's a great thing about GWIS because we are digital. Let's say you prepare a set of the story props to use as story props when you tell them with the children. You could make a second set and put it in your language center where they could use the props to tell it in their own way, or you could print out another set and they could use them for a sort and count game or a what, are, what am I game. Um, because we're digital, you can do that. It's not like we're just giving you one and you're done. If you need to print out another set or you want to print out another set, that's up to you. Our make it sheets, for those of you who are not familiar, are our printables that are optional. They are not written into the lesson plans. They are designed for children you feel are ready for them. In this case, they're creating their own Ferris wheel, and they're either going to cut pictures of people to put in the Ferris wheel, or they're going to even draw pictures of people to put in the Ferris wheel. And then this one is an I spy sheet. Truly, this could go home with every child if you wanted it to. It's a great, like, time killer if you're sitting in the doctor's office and you can use this to play I spy or you're sitting at a restaurant waiting for the food and they're getting antsy you could play I spy um, it's also a really good tool for building language and talking about vocabulary these are experiences for your more advanced children who are whoops I'm sorry I didn't mean to go that fast um, who are getting ready to go to kindergarten or who are, are just more advanced that you might want to get into more letters letter sounds literacy and also some more advanced math like algebraic concepts again we encourage you to read these and think about the children that are in your care can any of them would any of them really enjoy this? Would you see them really enjoying this activity? Would they learn something? And you can gauge that better than we can, but just knowing that these concepts are on a higher level. This page comes in very handy when you're talking about your state standards and how you're addressing them. So you know how I said that each activity had the picture codes that tie to the, the developmental areas. This chart, takes it a step further. So it has the experience, the fair is coming, and it has specific skills that each activity addresses or each experience addresses. If you want to know what LD1, LD2, LD3, and LD4 are, you can probably guess it's language development first and foremost. But if you want to know what 1, 2, 3, and 4 are, you need to go to our user's guide and look for the learning indicators. And that will tell you which learning indicators specifically that experience addresses. Those learning indicators are also the specific skills that we align with your state standards. So if you're required to show how you address state standards, all you need is this chart because it's going to show you specifically what skills you're addressing with each experience and that should easily transfer over into your state standards okay so we have the 10 area the 10 lesson plans the 10 days of lesson plans for all the children on that page and then your school age ones are just here because they didn't fit we give you a book list so you can go to the library and have your librarian help you find some of these books or other books related to the topic. And then the songs and poems, a lot of times you'll find in the back just because there's no room. We do a lot of original songs to tunes you will know. This one happens to be an action song where they act out different animals. Here's one about the Ferris wheel and the merry-go-round. And then 
this is actually something that you're going to use during some of the activities. I call these goodies or freebies. So if there are things that I can put in the back of the teaching guide when I write that I think would be helpful to you, I will give them to you. And in this case, all the children in one of the experiences are going to be creating art with their, you know, some of their favorite art experience. Like when we talk about crafts at the fair, one of the things we're going to talk about is art. So they're all going to create their own art. It's very child directed. They're going to do it however they want to do it. And guess what? When they come in the next day and you've displayed their art, everybody's going to get a blue ribbon. How exciting is that? So they'll probably really like that but you could also print out this page again that's the beauty of being digital and you could put extra ones of these blue ribbons in your dramatic play area you could put it in your literacy area you could even take it outside and the children could get blue ribbons for whatever they want to get blue ribbons for um, that's the beauty of it you can print out whatever you would like this is actually for a horse riding experience so again, to help you make some stick horses, because we all know we might not have those. And then some gee whiz bucks. So obviously the fair costs money. You have to buy food, you have to pay for rides, you have to buy tickets. And so this is something you can, again, print out as many copies as you want, put it in your dramatic play area, and the children can use it however they want to use it as they're role playing the fair, as they're role playing you know, riding rides, or if they're buying food, they can use the gee whiz bucks. Okay, so that is, and I know it's taken a long time to go through here, but I wanted to take some time on this one so we can make sure we get through it. That is the FAIR lesson plan. So there's a lot of information in here. Again, we're building the foundation. You're going to build the house, right? So you're going to take what we've given you and you're going to expand upon it and you're going to build upon it. Before I leave here and show you the other components for the FAIR and we go into the second unit, are there any questions I can answer whatsoever about this unit related to the FAIR? Um, I don't see anything typed in, but um, so if, go ahead and type them in while Beth goes on, because I know we're running out of time. We try to keep it to an hour. Uh, and um, Beth, I'll stop you if we get some questions that come in. Okay. Yeah, and it might take a little bit longer this first cohort to get through everything because I want to make sure that we spend enough time. Um, so hopefully it won't go too long for you. But like I said, we are recording it. So if you do have to leave, you can always come back and listen to the recording. All right, so we mentioned the story props. Again, a PDF file. You just click it and you're going to go up here. This is one thing you will need to print because it is a story prop. You're going to use it as a flannel board. And you can use it on a flannel board. You can use it on a blanket draped over your couch. If you don't have a flannel board, there's lots of ways we tell you in the teacher's guide how to prep it. But you'll want to print this one out, okay? And again, it's going to get mounted and cut apart. It's a counting story, as you can see. One Ferris wheel, two quills, three wooden toys, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Then we move on to the materials list. We have a materials list with every unit that we do. This is thanks to Angie in New York City who requested this, please, please, please. And we said, sure, 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 we can do this. So on this, you will see by the day, everything you're gonna need. Anything in red just means it needs a little extra prep or a little extra time to gather. So because we're posting these now on the 20th, I would encourage you to print out the materials list if nothing else or download them or whatever you want to do and study these ahead of time so you have lots of time to gather the things you need. And like I said, if you need, for instance, fabric scraps, you could ask parents or caregivers if they might be willing to you know, supply you with some of those or even friends or even relatives. Um, so that's your materials list. And then we have the review sheet. This is something you complete at the end. I'll come back to that. That's something you complete at the end just to say, okay, what did I learn from this unit and doing it with the children? Did they like it? Did they not like it? What were their favorite things? What would I do differently if I did it again? Okay. The add and enhance, again, thanks to Angie, was something we added to help you gather things that you can add to your learning centers. And we know that you're in your home, so you might not have your center set up all the time, but if you have tubs that you put things in, these are things you could gather to put in those tubs and then get out. They're just things that would enhance the unit. There's one of these for each unit, so in different areas that you can add to. Our letters and our literacy and letters or literacy letters and literacy. This is new. We just added this very recently. This is for, for, for children who are ready to go into more about 
letters, letter sounds, um, pre pre literacy skills. Okay, how do you know if they're ready? Well, there's a link here that really helps you know if a child is ready to do this or not. But you're going to know your children well enough, I think, to know if they're ready to do it. These are not worksheets. This is not like let's trace letters on a piece of paper. These are Here's our activity in the teaching guide, the page it's on, the letter you could integrate, and how you could do it in a meaningful way. And there's two pages of these types of experiences. So what I would encourage you to do, if you have children who are more advanced, who you feel are ready for this, I'd read through some of these experiences. And I'd say, hmm, do you think this suits? Do you think this fits? Do you think they're ready for this? And try it. And, and if they look at you with that look on your face, like I have no idea what you're talking about, and you might as well be talking in Chinese to me, then they're probably not ready. Um, I taught kindergarten, and up until January many years, that's kind of the look I got was like, lady, I don't know what you're talking about. And then all of a sudden the light would go on, they're like, oh, I get it. <laughs> so these are just ways that you can expose children to this if they're ready for it. That's why it's a separate piece and not written into the lesson plans because not everybody's re ready for it. And certainly your, um, your little people are not ready for it, like your toddlers. Uh, your All About Me My Week is a report you can print out. There's one for each week, and you fill it out, and you send it home on Friday. It's a way for you to communicate with parents about how the week went, where their children were spending a lot of their time, what they're learning how to do, and it's a great way for you to also um, keep a copy of this in their portfolio as kind of a running record of their development, and this is available in Spanish as well as English. Our family letter is digital so you don't even need to print it out and send it home with parents if you don't want to you can simply download it and then you can attach it as an email attachment and just send it to them as an attachment it talks about what the topic is in this case the fair and it also gives them some simple things to do at bath time meal time bedtime and when riding in the car there's usually a sign a song or a chant or something to say down here um, that being said this is available in spanish but we will, the, the song will obviously lose its rhyming pattern. So a lot of times I'll rewrite it into a chant or something that does not necessarily rhyme for the Spanish version so that they don't lose the rhyme scheme. And then the individualization web is covered in our user's guide, but this is a tool you can use to individualize each unit that GWIS does to match it to the child's interest and or if they have a disability or an area they're working on, you could use this tool for that as well. Again, a copy of this going in their portfolio would be an excellent way to show progress or where the child is, what their interests are, how you're adapting the unit to meet their needs and their, um, their interests, almost like an emergent curriculum. And there's one of these with each unit. The digital family notes are actually a JPEG file, which if you use an iPhone or a smartphone, it's like taking a photo with your phone. So if you save this to your computer or if you open it up and save it on your phone, you can actually text this to a parent or guardian. And it's a real simple way that they can integrate the unit into their daily lives with their children in a meaningful way. There are two of these. And there's the second one. I'm not going to go in there. And then the make it sheets, that was the Ferris wheel where they were going to add the people and the I spy that I said would be appropriate for anybody. Again, they're optional. You can choose to print them. You can choose not to use them at all. You can choose to use them with one child who you think is ready. Like one of them you might think is ready for this, but maybe everybody's ready for that. And that's, again, the beauty of GWIS. We're digital. So you can print up to 12 copies of any of these things to send home, to use with the children. That's your prerogative. Okay? So I'm going to go back out of here. And if you needed the Spanish of the family letter, the digital family notes, all about me, my week report, you would just go here and download them from there and they would be available in Spanish, okay? And then here we have our back to school unit, which is our second unit. This has a very strong focus on friendship. And before we get started with this, I've talked way too long. So I wanna ask a question about friendship. And I wanna ask a question about social interactions between children in your program, thinking about your children. And I want you to think particularly about a toddler, 
all right? And I want you to think about how most toddlers, not all toddlers, but most toddlers, if they're interacting socially with other children, do they A, engage in what I would call cooperative play, where, you know, they're putting on hats and they're pretending to be, you're the police officer and I'm the firefighter, or I'm the, I'm the, tra I'm the farmer and you're the, the dinosaur catcher or whatever they decide to be. Do they engage in cooperative, I mean, in play side by side where they're standing there playing at the water table together, but they might interact a little bit when it comes time for sharing activities or sharing materials, but they're not really interacting too much? Or do they not interact with anybody at all? Do they just do their own thing? So in the question box, thinking about your toddlers, think about how it is. Are they pretty much by themselves? Do they play side by side, but they don't really interact? Or do they cooperatively play? Okay, um, we have engage in parallel play, side by side, side by side, um, side by side with each other, but the older kids, they play together. Um, let's see. I'm sorry, someone's checking out. They gotta go to the grocery store. Side by side with some interaction. Side by side, but not interacting. Side by side with a little interacting. Ours are parallel and side by side. You guys are on the ball tonight. Absolutely. Toddlers are in a stage of what is called parallel play, meaning that they play side by side and they might interact when it comes to, I want that bucket and you have it so I'm going to take it but they don't really engage in cooperative play and that is developmentally appropriate so that is really important to keep in mind as you introduce this unit about friends because to a toddler a friend is somebody totally different than a friend is when you're four years old or five years old um, and so when we look at the experiences in the teaching guide for this unit you're going to see where that's accept I mean that's normal. That's what you should expect. Um, it doesn't mean they can't learn about what it means to be a good friend by watching your older children. It just means that they're not at that stage yet, and that's okay. Um, but it's really important to have that in mind as you introduce any unit. Again, just like talking about the fair and the background knowledge of the children regarding what they know about a fair, it's the same thing here. It's just this, exactly the same. What do they know about friendship? What does it mean to even be a friend? What is a friend? You know, um, for a toddler, that's a new term. What does it mean? And so just keeping all that in mind is really important. Just like the other unit, you're going to have the buttons for English and Spanish. I'm going to go on the English. And we're not going to spend nearly as much time in here talking about how the lesson plans are structured, but we're going to talk about language because that was the focus of tonight. And a little, little bit of time that we have left, that's what we're going to focus on is language development. So I'm going to go into the teaching guide. Again, just like before, you can print it, you can download it, whichever you would like to do. Definitely download everybody, everybody download and save. Print is optional. And it again begins with an introduction, table of contents, a reminder of what all those symbols mean. And then here's that chart if you want to print it out so parents know what's going on for the upcoming unit. And then we get into our lesson plans. So we start out obviously with what is a friend, right? Um, it's important that you understand what a friend is. And we have a puppet in this second unit. Our puppet is Foddy and he's our new friend. And so that opens the door in many different ways. This is a time of transition in a lot of programs because you might have, I was talking with a provider in Florida who's living, losing some of her children that are going off to kindergarten, which is always a sad time, especially if they've been with you since they were babies. Um, and there might be new children coming in. So this unit fits really well at this time of year because it is a time of transition. And in many states, uh, School will start back in August as opposed to September. So Fadi's our new friend, and we're going to introduce Fadi. We're going to sing a song, and then we're going to talk. We're going to make a mural. One of our first things we're going to do to get together is we're going to make a mural with handprints. And I want you to look at that experience, and I want to talk about these picture symbols. 
Remember, each one is an area of, of development. We have language development, approaches to learning, creative arts, social emotional, math, science, physical development and health, and literacy. Okay. During this experience, the children are going to be making a mural. And if you don't have mural paper, it's no worries. Just tape a couple pieces of white paper together and make a long sheet. So I want you to talk a little bit about what could happen during the um, during the experience where the children who are more verbal, okay, so we're talking about those children who are using words, how could they build language? But also at the same time, how could your nonverbal children, maybe your toddlers, what kind of nonverbal communication could they use as they engage with others during this experience? So just take a second, glance through what's going to happen during the experience, and then share your ideas in the question box. Again, what kind of things might you observe your more verbal children doing, or how could you help them build language skills during this experience as you engage with them? Because remember, this is child directed. You're not going to tell them how to make their handprints, right? But also, then I want you to also think about how you're going to, what your um, nonverbal children could do. That's a tough one. You don't have any um, responses yet, but I'm sure. Oh, here we go. Clapping with excited voices. It's good for the nonverbal. That's a great nonverbal. Uh, yeah. Yep. My um, granddaughter has learned to shake her head no, and that's her favorite thing to do right now. <laughs> no matter what. Her. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. That way. Everybody's getting tired. I can uh, tell. I'll get tired. The, <laughs> the verbal children will probably be the first to want to make their handprints, while the nonverbal children will observe and then copy that behavior. Exactly right about that. They always right. want to do what the older children are doing. Right. And your role during that is remember, you're going to engage, but you're not going to lead. So you're going to describe what's going on. Wow, you put your hand, this is for your nonverbals, you put your hand in that orange paint and then you put it on the paper and you lift it up and look what happened. It looks like your hand. Let's count the fingers. One, two, three, four, five. What color did you use? Oh, you used orange. Oh, look, so-and-so used orange. Again, you're adding words to their actions and that will help them build language. And yes, they learn from their older siblings or older siblings, a lot of case older siblings, but older children as they listen to them talk. Absolutely. Any other ideas? Uh, that's all we've got so far. That's okay. Every, those are all right. both good observations. Right. And when you're watching and you're observing, you're going to listen as the children engage in conversations with each other as well. That's going to help you evaluate each child's level of language and conversational sense. So as more verbal children engage back and forth with each other, hey, look, I just put a red handprint here and then I put a green handprint there and then some of it mixed and I made this or that or whatever. It's going to help you gauge their level of language skills too. The key is to remember that you're watching, you're observing, you're asking questions like this one. Why do you think handprints go along with friendship. There's no right or wrong answer to that, but it opens the door for a lot of conversation. And as one child converses with you, even your nonverbals are gonna learn as they listen to that conversation, okay? Does that make sense? All right, so on the, ne the next co topic for this unit, for the next day, we'll be up here, who are our friends at school? And in this, we put school in parentheses because we're gonna use school as your program um, and talk about the friends that are there. Because as we know, children have friends in many different places. Some may be in your program, some may be in their neighborhood. They may be at your church, their synagogue, it could be lots of different places. So let's look at another experience um, I was going to do about language. It's a little bit different. So here we have sometimes children play together. 
because that's true. Sometimes they play together, sometimes they play by themselves, and that's okay. Here's another example of where we're doing some quote-unquote cooking, where we're making a trail mix. Again, it opens the door for lots of language and also lots of sensory exploration. Next day is what makes a good friend. And in this one, here's a great one we're going to look at for language. All right, so we're going to read the story, The Little Red Hen. And it's actually in the back of this teaching guide, as is a prop, that cute little red hen right here, that you're going to make to tell this story. And The Little Red Hen is an excellent story to share regarding friendship. Because as you know, The Little Red Hen did all the work, but then everybody else wanted to eat the bread which is not really being a very good friend. So it opens the door for a lot of conversations. Hence, all these questions to the right. So what I'd like you to do right now, twist it up a little bit, is read those questions. And I want you to pick one and write how you think your children would answer it if you asked them that. Think about the children in your group. So maybe I'll just pick one. I'm going to pick one that says, why do you think the little red hen's friends would not help her? And I want you to think about how your children would answer that. How do you predict they would answer that? And type your, your answer in the question box. I'm sorry, Beth. You might want to just repeat that question one okay. more time. I will. Okay, so what I would like you to do is I'm looking at the question in the question box. It says, why do you think the little red hen's friends would not help her? And I want you to answer that like you think your children would answer that. Like if you ask your group right now, you read the little red hen and you ask them that question, what do you think they would say? Thinking about your more verbal children, what do you think they would say? Okay, they didn't want to work not helpful. We're not being good friends. <laughs> uh, they were tired. <laughs> um, they were tired or hot. They just didn't want to. And for a younger child, you can you see that. Um, how do you help your friends? Cleaning when they when they're sad, sharing, playing with them. Um, they were busy playing, so that's why they didn't want to help. Um, <laughs> he didn't want to share bread. <laughs> Um, they were just doing something else, and so that's why they didn't. Um, they were just too shy. Ooh, that's ah, insightful. <laughs> good. That is very insightful, <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, where do you think the story took place? At the hen house or in the kitchen? Ooh. Um, they were hungry and just couldn't help. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds like my kids. <laughs> it, it sounds like a response a three-year-old would say. I just, you know, I'm just hungry and I can't do it. <laughs> but that's that's really great. I mean, because what I wanted you to do there is I just wanted you to just think about the mindset of a three-year-old, right? I mean, we as adults have a totally different mindset than a three-year-old. They're in a very egotistical stage where they don't even, huh, even teenagers, they can't see sometimes how their behavior affects others, unfortunately. Um, and yes, I speak from experience. So what we, what we think about there is when we're asking those questions is, don't be shocked by any response that you get. And the point of asking an open and question like that is there's not a right or a wrong answer. It's what the child thinks. And the goal there, as, as we're talking about language development, is for them to learn to share their ideas out loud using words. And again, yes, you're going to have children who are nonverbal, but that's okay. They're going to learn as they listen to this conversation going back and forth and they hear others sharing their ideas. Um, nonverbal communication, like Sherry just said, shaking your head no, nodding your head yes, um, clapping your hands, all of those things are ways that toddlers and nonverbal twos and even some less limited language skill threes will share their ideas with you. You just have to be receptive and open to the fact that you're not going to get a word out of their mouths, but you're going to get some type of body language. And so you have to be cued into that. And also, as I mentioned earlier, when we looked at the one experience where they were, um, we're, we're doing something where you're going to be describing their actions, you're going to describe what happens, you're going to describe the materials they use, 
All of those things are ways that you can help nonverbal children build future vocabulary and receptive language skills. In other words, they're receiving it in. They're not expressing it out yet, but that's okay because they will eventually express it out. Does that make sense? So this unit about friendship is a great way to start your school year. Um, again, lots of open-ended experiences like this fun with flower. They're experiencing and exploring different types of flower. And uh, this is in red. You'll notice it'd be in red on the materials list so that now when you're at the grocery store, you might want to get some whole wheat flour if you don't have any. You might want to get some bread flour. You might even get some cornmeal and the children can explore how they're all different. Um, bakers are we, we're gonna play with Play-Doh. No right or wrong way to do this. We're gonna pretend to be bakers just like the little red hen. Obviously, your more advanced children are gonna get more into the dramatic play side of things, but does that mean it's not appropriate or not a meaningful experience for your younger ones? Absolutely not. They're gonna build fine motor skills, fine motor coordination, they're gonna use their senses, they're gonna do so many different things. So the beauty of Gee Whiz and the reason that we built this curriculum the way we did was so you could do one experience knowing that in a lot of cases it's just you and the children. You could do one experience like you can set out the Play-Doh and the, the bread pans and the pie plates and add in your blank index cards or recipe cards and a marker for your more advanced children, but your younger ones will just simply have fun playing with the Play-Doh and they'll learn by watching and listening to your other ones and, and, as we're talking about tonight, language development, engaging with you in conversations, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And that will help them, your younger ones, again, build the receptive skills, and your older ones, your more advanced ones, build their receptive, I mean, their expressive skills, okay? So language is built into all of these experiences. Again, you're just looking for the speech bubble. Any experience you see with that means the children will be listening, they'll be using expressive language, they'll be using nonverbal communication, they'll build receptive skills. If you see that speech bubble, you know you are doing language development. But again, I want to impress upon you that a part of your role in all of that is to be engaged with the children and not be afraid to ask as they're playing, for instance, up here, saying things like, tell me about what you're making. Don't assume that you know, especially with art, like <laughs> never ask a child, what is that? Because they already assume you know what that is. So instead, tell, tell say something, oh, tell me about your painting or tell me about what you're making with a Play-Doh or tell me about your block structure or your building. Um, that opens a door for a lot of language and they don't feel disappointed that you don't automatically know what it is because let's face it, sometimes it's really hard to tell what it is. When my son was younger, even like late preschool, he was not the best artist. And he used to draw all these people, we called them potato people because they had really big bodies and very little like arms. <laughs> but, you know, we knew they were people, we just didn't know who they were. So tell me about what your art is or tell me about your Play-Doh creation is a better way to ask that because it opens that door and keeps it wide open so they can tell you all about it. Um, so it's now 844. I feel like I've talked way too long. Um, so what I would like to do right now is I would like to see if they have you have any questions um, for those of you who are using the curriculum about either of the units coming up for August. For those of you who are not using the curriculum, any questions you have about how it works, um, I am going to go back out to the home page in just a second because I want to show you a few things there that we touched on. Um, but also, I want to see if there's any, um, I know we always have a question regarding assessment, and I do want to cover that. In the user's guide, and I'm going to just go right back out here to the home page, under our products, you'll see right here the GWIS curriculum user's guide. This is like our training manual. So when you first start with GWIS, we encourage you to download. This is a 50 some page document, but it covers all the areas of development. It covers the research behind the curriculum. It covers the philosophy. It covers, there's a whole section on anecdotal notes, observations, reflections, individualization. Um, it covers all the different components. So we encourage you to read through here, the learning indicators that I talked about, the specific skills like what LD1, LD2, LD3, LD4, they are in this guide. So again, to get there, I just went to our products and the user's guide. So that's a really important 
tool that if you're new to the curriculum, you would want to at least download and have on your computer and take some time to read through. Um, but that's one thing I wanted to point out. And then also our alignment charts and those people in Ohio who have all those crazy forms that you need to do that I mentioned that we are providing some help with can be found here under this tab. So you would just go to, um, and we are, oh, Florida just popped up. We're reapproved in Florida for anybody on the call from Florida for 2020, um, just in case you wanted to know. And then Ohio, all those forms are JF1, 07, 90, and 91. Those are all the ones we just did and posted that would help you fill out those forms. We can't do it for you, um, but we've provided some guidance on you know, what you might want to put in the different boxes. All right, with that said, I am going to stop talking and see if anybody has any questions um, regarding formal assessment. Before I do that, you can use any formal assessment tool you want gold, ages and stages, ounce, whatever you use, whatever you choose to use, we're covering all 10 developmental areas for all ages. So I know we have providers, for instance, in Ohio that are five-star rated, accredited programs. I know we have an accredited provider in Florida and they're using whatever assessment tool they feel works best for them. Uh, if their state requires, a, you know, choosing off of a list, they've chosen the one they think would work best and their children are doing quite well. I know that always comes up, so I want to make sure I address it. All right. Now, I'm going to stop talking and see if anybody has any questions that I can answer before we call it a night, because I know I'm tired and I'm sure you all are too. <laughs> um, I don't have any questions typed in, but I did send out in, the, in your question box or chat box that if you have questions after the webinar is over, please send them to customerservice at gwizeducation.com and the email is right there, the right-hand side of your screen. And also to be sure to complete the quiz to get your certificate of attendance if that's something that you would like. Um, but that, that's the way instead of sending it to customer service, you do need to complete that quiz. Um, and again, we'll be glad to answer questions after this is over with. And if you want to come back and review, all you got to do is use that registration link. And that's where the recording will be before until we get it posted on the website. Um, and Beth, we don't have any questions. We did have a provider online tonight that we were hoping to get her online to share her experience, but we've just kind of flat run out of time. Um, so hopefully we will have most of you back again next month and we'll go through the next program. Uh, or yeah, the uh, September program. Sherry, um, is but Adrian if there are on? no more, did Adrian get yeah, on? Yes, he is. Adrian, yes, do you want us to uh, unmute you and you can be our our wrap up and tell us? You know, she's been a customer for a long time and and has shared a right. lot of really helpful tips. Adrian, we can try to unmute. Let me see you. if I can click. Uh, unmute. Too many people. It won't let me. Uh, Adrian, I'm sorry. Unless I've got you on the phone, I can't unmute you. And it looks like you're using your computer. We're going to have to practice this for next time so we can <laughs> unmute you. Uh, it just will not let me. It says too many people. So I'm sorry about that because I know Adrian's always got some just great ideas and just so much energy and so much knowledge. I just love talking to her. So anyway, thank you guys so much for coming tonight. Um, and again, this will be recorded. And with that, we're going to say good night and see you next month. If not, good before. night, everyone. Let us know if you have any questions. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Yeah. Thanks. Bye.